Welcome to the Recruiter Startup Podcast. My name's Dolta Doherty, and in this podcast series, I'll be interviewing investors, advisors, entrepreneurs, and recruiters who are based all over the world. And we will be discussing how to set up, scale, and operate a world-class recruitment company. Today, we'll be focusing on the operating piece. And I'm speaking to Fraser Campbell, who's a senior manager with Robert Half in Melbourne. He started out working for them in Edinburgh, where he's from, and has been with Robert Half for about 11 years, the last four of which in the wonderful city of Melbourne. So we kind of had a bit of a chat about the differences in the two cities and what it takes to be successful to move to Australia and uh, to really make that move work for you and what, uh, what he's seen as the key differences between recruiting in the UK and in Australia. Also, we kind of jumped into what it takes to be a top performer or managing a top performing team and you know, why he continues to stay with Robert Half as opposed to move to a boutique or set up his own recruitment firm. And he went into all of those things as well. So really great guest, great fella. Enjoyed speaking to him. I hope you enjoy it too. Fraser Campbell, how are you today? I am very well, Dilta. How are you? I'm not too bad at all. We are in the last weeks of getting our house renovated. So it's been a stressful few weeks, but we're almost there. How's life yeah. in Melbourne? Life in Melbourne is good. We had uh, Melbourne Cup Day today, so we all get a day off. As you know, uh, Australia loves a public holiday, so today was <laughs> Melbourne Cup. Um, um, yeah, Melbourne Cup. Day, Melbourne Cup indicates the end of work till Christmas. Isn't that right? <clears throat> Pretty much. I always remember being back in the UK and I just could not get my head around the fact that they had a, a public holiday for a horse race. And then when I moved over here, I found out they also had a public holiday for a an Australian rules football game. So it's it's kind it, of par for the course over here. It is. And a good luck trying to fill your quarter quotas after Melbourne Cup Day because... It, it, it's clients go missing. It's I couldn't believe it when I was there, and and I was in I was in Western Australia, so we kind of only got a a taste of it. But it, it just it's hard to explain to people who are listening how intense people are about that day and how Australia shuts down beyond it. That's it. Well, they call it the race that stops a nation. So I think I've I've been in Sydney before on Melbourne Cup Day, thinking that they wouldn't care all the bars and everything kind of stops. Everyone kind of stops working and watches this horse race. So it's, it does get a fair bit of hype. So talk to me about how you got into recruitment. You've been in it now for, what have you been in, about, about eight or nine years? Um, oh, a little bit longer. So I've about 11 years oh. now. So I, I was the kind of classic story, finished uni, Wanted to know what I wanted to do, but had absolutely no idea. So I thought, I'll go traveling. Did the traveling for nine or ten months. Came back. Still had no idea. So I was kind of frantically kind of looking through Edinburgh University's career website, trying to find something good to do with my life. And I just kept on coming across these recruitment ads that kind of talked about uncapped earnings and building your own business with a, within a business. And that, that kind of really appealed to me. So I started to to farm out cover letters to try and see what this was all about and, and that was the start of it really I went to interview at Hayes and I went to interview at Robert Half and then I joined Robert Half in 2007. And you, you studied history in university I see here so yeah but yeah do you know what's funny you know the, probably people think that's not related but you know you're you're learning a lot like probably it is probably more related than a lot of subjects because you're you know you're learning a lot of stuff that's happened you're reciting that, and have you found have you found have you found that you're able to tell stories better in recruitment based on that? Maybe. I mean, to be honest, I wanted to go to uni, and I thought I'm I'm pretty I'm not the best at maths. I'm not the best at the kind of science subjects. So I thought I need to do something that's English based. I kind of enjoyed history when I was at school, so I thought I'll go with history. That will get me four years at uni. I'll get a degree and we'll see what happens. And, and I did enjoy it. And have I used it working in <laughs> recruitment? Uh, maybe, yeah. I suppose it, it teaches you how to structure things, if anything. Yeah, else. and uh, it, 
I know the, the UK history section only teaches you about two world wars. Must have been an eye opener learning about all the, all the other stuff that's gone on. Well, it's funny because when people find that you've done a history degree, they think that you know about everything. So they'll ask you something that happened in you know the 15th century and you'll say, I have no idea. And they'll say, you know, I thought you did a history degree. And you're like, yeah, but you specialize in certain areas. You don't know about everything that's ever happened. And uh, t- talk to me. So what, what year did you, did you get into recruitment? So I started in 2007. I, was, I think I was 22, just about to turn 23 at the time. Okay. So you had a nice little run before everything went wrong, right? Absolutely. That was it. I was just getting into my stride. I was thinking, oh, this is really good. I'd made a couple of little bonuses and I was thinking, this job's great. And then all of a sudden, everything came crashing down. Wow. And I, uh, I started in Robert Walters and very similar company to Robert Half in, uh, in, in many ways. We've had a lot of people when I was there transition over from Robert Half, hire the same type of people. The intensity of the work is, is similar, mm-hmm. Qu- quite similar in many ways. So I can relate to what those early days would have been like, but I never faced a crash like that, like the global mm-hmm. financial crisis. Did at that stage were you think were you a temp consultant or a perm consultant? Yeah, I started on temp, and it was it was actually really. I look back and think, thank God I had that first year that showed me that there could be success in the job because I, I reckon if I'd started in, you know, two thousand and eight or two thousand and nine, I might not have stuck it out, but I, I knew that there was good aspects to the role which made me kind of motivated to keep pushing on when things were really difficult um, what year did you start hankering for an international move um i have to be honest it happened really quickly i had absolutely no desire to move abroad you know i watched people leave different offices around the uk to go to places like australia and i always thought what are they doing why would you give up your life here and go away from your friends and family but then I think it was it got to the kind of midpoint of about 2013 and just instantly I just started I, I just got this itch and I, I wanted to to move so I messaged one of my former colleagues in Edinburgh who was living in Melbourne and just said you know how are you getting on what's what's life like out there how's the market um, and as soon as that happened the conversation started and by the start of 2014 I'd moved all right and uh, what what part of the city did you move to uh, so initially Robert Half put me up in the kind of right in the city for a month or so just to get my bearings and then I lived on St Kilda Road for about a year and since for the last three and a half years we've lived in a sort of inner city suburb called Paran which is about two or three k's out of the posh. city. Mm. Yeah you could say that but <clears throat> it's very very expensive to buy a property so we still rent but I reckon if, if you buy a property you're, you're looking to move yeah. a little bit. Yeah I lived in Sydney Road and uh yeah. Oh yeah. It's behind the bar, a bar called the Retreat. I don't know if you know it. No, okay. It's, uh, yeah, a wonderful dive there. bar. Wonderful memories of the, of that time. Um, but I was only only living there for six months. Um, so what that transition from Edinburgh to Melbourne, uh, two kind of artsy cities. Um, was there any similarities in in, in living in in both places? <laughs> Uh, to some extent I think they're both quite relationship driven cities when it comes to work um, you know they're similar in the sense that people appreciate you know a, a good beer they appreciate sport you know people are generally really friendly I think I found that in it, living in Edinburgh and living in Melbourne people are you know are good to speak to and they want to get to know you and everything so there's definitely some similarities definitely not no. the other though and tell me so, so, so you come in you're you're were you a big biller in uh, in Edinburgh? I mean, I did okay. I think, and and you know, based against other people in Edinburgh, I probably did did well. You know, I was one of the top billers in, in that office. But then, in comparison to say, you know, for people in London or in the bigger metro markets, that you know, couldn't even get close. And that was part of my motivation to move was that I, I just kept, had this kind of burning feeling inside that if I could get into a, a bigger city and a bigger market, I would be able to realize much bigger earning potential and, and, and kind of see see what else was and out what there. What was that like starting over again, having been established, having been in the business? You've probably joined a business where the leadership team are, are, are quite quite established and all the rest, but there's always a mm-hmm. cycle of new consultants coming to Australia, especially before the changes. Well, what was that mm-hmm. like for you? Were you did, 
did you get to go in at a, a more senior level or was it really feeling like you were starting all over again? Yeah, no, I completely started all over. I joined a team, which I'm still on now. It was a, a kind of high-performing team in the Melbourne office and in the kind of Australian operations where they had, at the time, three or four consultants who were very, very established. And they had, you know, a lot of clients, a lot of big clients. So my job was to come in and try and find, you know, other other business out there. And it was tough, but I was, I was at the time, I was really driven. I was I sort of was excited about the move. I was excited about working in a big market and a big, you know, a, a kind of big city and I was really hungry and I was also sort of scared as well. I mean, Robert Half, as you know, is especially in the UK, when you join, there's expectations that you you work really hard and that you get up to a certain level. And so I kind of came over and just almost pretended I was a rookie and said, right, if I'm not on a certain number of attempts out by a certain period, of, you know, I'm going to be under fire here. So I kind of just got my head down and worked really hard. And how, how does somebody come into a market that's already mapped and try and squeeze out something else what was your kind of strategy i mean i think i had i always had belief that there would be other things there because in a way it was it was a benefit as well that these other consultants had such established businesses because i thought they're probably quite comfortable they're probably not out chasing after lots of new stuff um, and to some extent that was true so i thought if, if they've already got their clients i can go out and try and use the experience i've got in edinburgh and working through recession and everything to try and generate new business and take market share and that was what i focused on initially and still do to some extent and you start to see the little wins coming through and i could definitely notice a difference in working a bigger market it was much easier to to get traction were there any differences in uh in dealing with uh candidates from ed from the edinburgh standpoint to to what it's like in melbourne was it really easier to find were they were they easier to deal with <laughs> I'd say, yeah, I'd say easier to find just because Melbourne's such a big city. I mean, we still have the same issues that you have probably anywhere in the world where there's candidate shortages in certain areas. But there was there was definitely, I found it easier to, to get hold of people when you needed to. Um, and, and the candidate base is great over here. It's, you know, people are, they come from far and wide. They don't mind traveling. They're realistic about things and they, they tend to be really good to deal with. And tell me, so you've been there for a while now. There must be rector acts hitting you up every day. Um, people are trying to launch offices, all the rest. What what is it that uh, that's kept you there? Well, it's funny you say that because I think I don't know if in, maybe I'm wrong, but in recruitment, I think you reach a point where people stop trying to tap you up because they look at your profile and go, oh, "He's never moving. You know, he's been there eleven years. There's no danger he's moving." But I suppose I've I've stayed just because I've I've always felt happy and content in the business. I've always you know, liked working for Robert Half. I think it's a, a cracking business, you know, both locally and globally. And I've always been lucky that I've been part of really good teams. You know, in, in Edinburgh, I had great management, great leadership, good teams, made really good friends, and everyone got on really well. There was no, you know, trying to kind of shaft each other or, you know, everyone out for themselves. It was a real good sort of family office. And, and it's the same in Melbourne. Everyone looks out for each other. There's a lot of tenure in the office, a lot of really good operators and good performers and you look around not just in melbourne but across the sort of asia pacific region and across the world really and you see all these these great people that have stayed for the business for such a long time and you think well although some people go off and build really successful careers starting on their own or going to work for smaller boutiques there's, there's definitely lots of good opportunities within the business as well yeah lots of people have uh, have set up boutiques who've left robert half put in a lot of robert half work mechanisms i think one of the mm -hmm. things that has interested me about robert half as a business is the you, you spend a certain amount of, maybe you could explain this a little bit better than me because uh, uh just for the record I, I i don't really work with robert or robert half this is just from from dealing with people over the years but it's uh you'll do candidates for a little bit you'll do clients for a little bit how does that how does that work work there's kind of like a rotation system or something yeah i mean every <clears throat> it's hard there's not really a, a sort of set way for each division like we work on a, our team works on a rotational basis some divisions don't they do what's called inside outside where one person's a candidate generation source and one person's a business development expert so all the teams operate differently but they i think when they bring in new starters they try and get you 
predominantly you start with candidates because it's a little bit easier. It's a chance to kind of feel your way into the market, make your mistakes before you start going out and, and meeting clients and speaking to clients. Um, okay, so it's a, that, that, that model is kind of flexible depending on, on the team that you join, is it then? Yeah, absolutely. They're, every, every, they all operate differently. I'm not sure what, what it's like in the States, whether they're a little bit more rigid, but over here they kind of have a policy of, you know, if it's working, keep it. And, you know, the individual managers are open to being able to kind of implement changes and things like that. And, uh, okay, so you've been there for a while. You must have seen a lot of people who've not made it through the process. What Mm-hmm. specifically with people coming over from the UK what would you say is the thing that sets the people who become successful to the people who end up going back within uh, within six months uh, yeah good question I think it's, it's getting that combination right of, of volume and quality I think you get some recruiters that think, oh, you know, I'm great, so I don't need to do that much. I don't need to do the volume anymore because I know what I'm doing. And then you get some people who are really, really hard working, but they, all, they don't quite know how to join the dots. So I think sometimes where people don't make it is they, they, they get maybe a little bit too comfortable in the culture in Australia because I've certainly noticed even in Robert Half, there's not as much, you probably, it's not as KPI driven as it is perhaps in the UK. So sometimes if you're on a team and you've got a manager who's, billing a lot of money you think oh well he's not doing that much so I don't need to do as much and you get lulled into that false sense of security that the market's great because everyone just wants to go for coffee all the time and it's it's easy so I don't have to pound out the calls whereas it's trying to get that blend of quality and volume right and that's what makes people really successful if you can do both of those things in a market like this you know you can you can do really well how do you find the time to meet everybody for coffee and still do the job the, it's the it, it, I find that the hardest piece, you know, and I remember, I remember when I was at Walters, after I'd met everybody once, I just kind of decided, you know what, I'm not going to go out and do this again. I'm just going to sit at my desk and fill jobs and phone people up. Mm-hmm. And I know that's against the, 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 the Australian ethos, but I just found it incredibly time consuming. How, how do you, how do you yeah. go about managing your day with having coffee with everybody? And no, you you're absolutely right. And I think it becomes in the UK, it was so hard to book meetings with people because they were so precious of their time. You know, if you were going to meet someone, it was usually because you were going to be speaking about a job, you were going to try and add value quite quickly for them. Otherwise they, they typically didn't want to give up their time. Whereas over here, it's the complete opposite. And you ha- you have to be almost, as you say, you have to be really selective about your time because most people are going to want to go for a coffee or want to catch up with you. So you have to be asking yourself the question, is this, worth me jumping in a cab for 20 minutes to go and have an hour's coffee and then come back to the office you know you have to make sure that you really qualify people because people will just be like yeah yeah you want to catch up for a coffee no problem <laughs> they, they, they'll sit and chat to you for two hours yeah. and you get back to the office and you think they mustn't be that busy because they've just sat and spoke to me for two hours and they're, they're not even remotely thinking about recruiting anyone i know it, it, it makes me anxious even thinking about it i'm much more suited to the american way of working where you know, you might not even have to meet them. They just say, send me this, find this for me. If you do that, we'll do business again. If you, if you don't, yeah. forget about it. Or just hit me up whenever you do find that. Yeah. And yeah, and I, I, I probably thought that, you know, in, in Australia, maybe my, I did quite well there, but my, maybe my style wasn't as suited to it as it would be in, uh, in more product-driven markets. Do you think that, do you think that that, that that unique way that Australia works as a bit of an outpost where you know you have to go and meet people and you have to do the face to face. Do you think that'll always continue or will 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 it become much more speed to market and product driven like the rest of the world? Um, good question. It's hard to say. I mean I think Melbourne remains quite relationship driven and I think that will continue. I, I mean I can't really speak for somewhere like Sydney. Sydney is more I suppose would be compared more to somewhere like London or New York, which is more fast paced and more perhaps more transactional. But Melbourne's very relationship driven and people will tend to buy from you because they know you or they, they really like you. You've met you a few times. So, you know, the, the whole coffee thing is 
it's important if you're meeting the right people and especially in the first instance i always think if you can get out in front of someone that you haven't transacted with before who perhaps uses other suppliers or they've got other ways of recruiting if you can get out in front of them for half an hour and and build rapport with them and they like you they'll typically they'll, they'll give you business and then after that it's perhaps not as important to keep going out all mm. the time but i think melbourne as a generally as a market you know I, I i don't think it will change in the near future i think it'll always be very relationship focused well one of the things i, I always advise recruiters when when they're asking me about different countries and they're saying um, like who should i join in america or like or what like what should i look out for and all the rest in america you know i I always I always say, look, it's all about the platform. It's all about the product that you're that you're that you're selling, and if you're in a good system and you can get good product out, you'll make money. In Australia, it's mm-hmm. all about the manager you join, and I can't stress that enough because they will have spent three to four, five years, whatever it is, out there meeting all those people in their local place. So you don't have mm-hmm. to spend eighteen months doing all that. They can they can cherry pick the ones that they think are right. And then you can then get to making money. And if you don't do that and, mm-hmm. and you start thinking that you've learned it all in the UK and you go to Australia, oh, I, I know it all, I'll, I'll just go and I'll map it out. You're in for a bit of a surprise. Absolutely. And I found that myself in Canada. You know, Canada is very, very regional focused marketplace. And again, everybody will meet you for a, can- for a coffee. But uh, they'll not be, they'll not be in a hurry to pay pay an invoice or do some business, you know. So, so Fraser, tell me what, at what point, you've never thought of setting up your own recruitment business. <clears throat> not at this stage, no. I mean, down the track, who knows? But you know, at this moment in time, I'm still pretty happy having things done for me you know here's a new system that we're going to put in or you know all those kind of I still value working for a big company at the moment I like the the, the kind of inter-regional trips that we do I like the the kind of global scorecards and walking at the office and there's 50 people there I still kind of get a, a big kick out of that and that buzz and I think when I've there's been times where I've maybe gone and met with mates who run small recruitment firms or been exposed to that kind of side of things and I've kind of thought you know it sounds great and I'm, there's obviously a massive upside to running your own business but then I've also thought you know I, would, I kind of want I still want the buzz of working in a big company and being part of that kind of global structure definitely at least for a few more years yet and then in the future who knows and if you were to what would you do how would you set it up um I mean I suppose if I was going to do it I think you need a few people that you really trust and that you've worked with and you, you know that the, the kind of effort's going to be there from all parties and I think you would be, I mean I've only ever done accountancy and finance so naturally I would probably gravitate towards that and, 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 and just go about building a business the same as what I've done when I started in Edinburgh and when I started in Australia kind of try and put the focus on the billing side straight away get your infrastructure set up and get that side of things sorted and then get out there and, and, and try and see what you can build up. And we, uh, we, we talked briefly before about the, the image of the, of the industry. Could you elaborate mm-hmm. a little bit on that? Yeah, I mean, I, I'm a big advocate of, you know, recruitment, people that work in recruitment being, you know, actually being consultants as opposed to salespeople. Mm-hmm. I think sometimes if you ask someone that doesn't work in recruitment, you know, what's your perception of a recruitment consultant a lot of the time they'll say oh they're salespeople or they're they're trying to make a quick buck or they're all about their commission they don't care about their product or the candidate or whatever it's it's really not the case so i'm a big advocate of you know we are partners you know we're specialists in what we do and for a lot of companies that we help you're really really adding value by finding them people that they would not be able to find without us so it's i'm always trying to kind of promote our job as you know as specialist services as consulting as opposed to you know being a salesperson or being someone that's that's purely driven by commission yeah i i wonder what is it that we could do that would i think i think a lot of it comes down to pride in what you do and Mm -hmm. and, you know you, you hear a lot of people say they fall into recruitment you don't really hear people say they fall into management consultancy you know they're they're, Mm -hmm. that's right where you know the like a lot of recruiters I know could be a management consultant. You know, it's like 
especially if they have some spreadsheet skills and they can do a lot of them all have the same degrees as well. So mm-hmm. I wonder what I wonder what else it is that uh, that that we could do. I I also think Australia is kind of unique, you know, because at least in the UK you'll have people from all walks of life uh, become recruiters. In in Australia, it's it's really seen as an expat job, and more, mm-hmm. I don't know if I'm speaking out of turn here, but that that's what I found when I was speaking to people in the room and, and clients and, and that, it just seemed like, oh, another person from the UK or Ireland. Mm-hmm. Yeah, absolutely. And that, that's the thing. It's hard when you, sometimes when you pick up the phone to someone, they, they hear your accent, they think, oh, here we go again. It's recruiter number four of the day. Where are you from? Are you from London? Are you from Scotland? Are you from Dublin? And it's, you, you know, you've got to try and break that perception down and be able to get the message across that, hang on a minute here, I'm actually pretty good at what I do and we offer a service that, that will really benefit your business. And Fraser, you, you ma- how many people do you manage right now? So, I mean, at the moment, my team is relatively small. I've got two cons- sort of 360 consultants that I manage, plus one that focuses on candidate generation for us. Okay, great. So, so are they quite experienced hires? Yeah, the two that I manage, they've both got experience now. One's about four and a half years, and the other one's two and a half years and then the resourcer is is fairly new but they're all very very good and it makes my job you know fairly easy in the sense that I'm, I'm not spending hours and hours and hours training someone on how to do recruitment they all know what they're doing and, and for the, me the management aspect is more trying to get them to the next level or you know helping them when they need some support with something and what what type of things would that be um, so you get all the day-to-day things. Oh, I've got this difficult negotiation. How do I approach this? Or, you know, what would you advise? How would I go about, you know, getting some traction with this client? You know, how do I build up a book that's got a higher blend of accountants versus transactional finance staff so I can get a little bit more revenue on the bottom line, that kind of thing. So it's just, you know, that aspect of it. And I, I do enjoy the the management side of things, but I think I've always been pretty heavily driven from from the billing side like I remember starting in a couple of years being 24 25 and I thought geez I've got a long time until I can retire <laughs> what happens if I get what happens if I get sick of placing candidates in two or three years and I want to do something different what am I going to do and now here I am sort of 11 years on and I still get the, the biggest kick from you know a, a new piece of business coming in that I've been working on for two or three years or yeah, a new client or a you know a big placement or something that still gives you the the kick to to push on. And do you think you're addicted to it? Oh, you probably. If you ask my other half, she would say I am. I think it's one of these jobs where it's it's hard to switch off. You're thinking about stuff. You're in the shower in the morning. You think, oh, what about this guy for this <laughs> job or whatever? It, it is one of these jobs that it, it's hard to it's hard to completely switch off from it because you're it's your business at the end of the day. Or even if you're working for a a Robert Half or a Hayes or a Michael Page, you're still running a business within a business. Yeah. And uh, you mentioned that uh, you mentioned you'd listen to a few of the other episodes. Which which ones did you manage to catch? Oh, I've listened to quite a few, some crackers. I like the American ones. It was the, the I like the one the guy that runs bills like a million dollars a year in the US from his house. He was funny. Um, I've listened. I listened to the Alex Moyle one because I know Alex. He was a, a, a big influence for me actually when I started at Robert Half. He was he was one of my trainers. Um, and there's I've listened to it quite a few actually they're great and uh, yeah no that's it that's that that's great um his name escapes me now but I know the guy you're on about that I, I've, I've done 52 interviews now so um he builds he builds a million from his house in Boston and mm-hmm. he's very old school in the way that he goes how and I think he despairs a little bit on the the millennial culture out there and digital mar- digital mm-hmm. marketing and and all of that have have you seen a big shift in terms of people's willingness to get on the phone um since the since the because you've you've really come through in the in area when it was all phone based mm-hmm. to almost becoming mm-hmm. a digital marketing platform have you have you seen a big difference in yeah, the people and and that side of things yeah i think so and i think you know, there's more and more of a, a shift towards, you know, your online presence and, you know, your your content on LinkedIn. And there's definitely more focus on that now. I mean, I still think personally, from my perspective, it's still a phone-based job. 
you know, a lot of the stuff that you, you generate ultimately and initially it'll come from a, a phone call. You know, it's great having presence on LinkedIn and it's great getting out to meet people and everything. But I'm always trying to stress to the, the guys in the office that, you know, if you, if you pick up the phone enough times and you say the right things and you speak to the right people, you're not going to struggle. You know, the people that struggle are people that try and make the job that try and cut the corners or try and say, oh, I'm, I'm, I don't need to make all the phone calls because I've got LinkedIn or I've got, you know, this, that, or the next thing. Like, the more people you speak to, the more information you gather and the, the better chance you've got of being successful. And a lot of the time that's, you know, just accepting the fact that you're going to have to pick up the phone. Yeah, so, sorry, his name's Rich Rosen, by the way. And and uh, and I, I follow him a lot on Facebook. And he always has little snippets about like way, ways that he's overcome things. And a really good guy to follow on Facebook in the recruiter online group. Mm-hmm. Um, well, that was the thing. The thing I liked about him as well is that he was he was billing a million dollars a year. But his, his, his method was the same. He said, I, I get up in the morning, you know, I make my cold calls or whatever. He, you know, he says, I'm not just sitting massaging my pipeline and filling jobs. He says, no, I'm out winning business. And, you know, I get to the end of the day and I plan for the next day. Then I have my night and I get up and I do it all over again. Yeah, see, I'm probably on the other spectrum. Um, I, I prefer running a business rather than being a recruiter. And I, I, I enjoy being a recruiter. And I, I like working with, with, with candidates, but some of it I, 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 I probably just, I don't know if, I, if I'm not, I'm not, it's hard to, hard to describe, but I, I probably get lost a little bit in the in the creative side, doing podcasts and things mm-hmm. like that. And mm-hmm. so, so when I when I've made a hire myself recently, I actually hired quite a traditional recruiter who doesn't know much about social media, because I thought, oh well, I'll at least be able to do all that side for you, and then that'll just let you focus on on hitting the phone and and doing things that people aren't doing as much with now. Because I really see, I really think that the probably. The company, there's a real place for the company to do all of that automation, marketing, and all of that for you, and then just for you mm-hmm. to have a hot set of lists to call through and make the action happen. Not that I want to be the person making the calls, but I, that's what I think. Yeah. That's where 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 I'm I'm kind of going with it. But uh, mm-hmm. it's it's a hard one to know what the future of agency recruitment will will look like. Do you think it will change much in the next five years? Well, I mean, I think the technology piece will continue to be important and companies will try and evolve, but the, the principles of the job will, will likely remain the same. You've still got to get out there and build relationships and you've got to be able to add value and you've got to be able to kind of do something that your competition's not doing, be able to kind of set yourself apart and, and you know, establish yourself. Mm. Okay, Fraser. Well, thanks very much for coming on the podcast. We uh, really enjoyed getting to have a chance to speak to you about your career and I'll be following to see what's next. And if you ever, ever do decide to set up your own recruitment company, I'll be, uh, I'll be having a look to see what you do. Absolutely. No problem. Listen, thank you for having me on. I appreciate it. All right. Take care, Fraser. Thanks, Dilta. Well, a massive thank you to Fraser for coming on the podcast. Great to hear he's having a great time in Melbourne. One of the things we touched upon at the end there was f- calling and phone time. And, you know, Robert Half are a traditional large agency and they'll have KPIs in place and, you know, they'll be monitoring your phone time and m- making sure that, you know, all of those things are in place. It, it is a challenge getting the next generation of recruiters on the phone because we're so used to trying to get results through digital media through 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 linkedin through 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 all of the all the other means that are out there to us so and i i'm speaking personally here as well i can avoid making a lot of cold calls by trying to be creative on linkedin or a podcast or whatever it is but i think that leaves a big hole in my business and i probably do a lot better if i was to get on the phone and make more calls so that that's why we've uh, we've hired angela hill to come on board and help us out to service some of our clients because 
we really just needed an old school recruiter to be able to complement a lot of the digital marketing and newer type techniques that we implement a lot. So really excited to see how that will come on, will will take place over the next little while. And I'll have Angela on the podcast very soon to talk about her career. She's been in it for nearly 20 years now. So that'll be an interesting chat too. All right. Till next time. The podcast you just heard was made using Anchor. Ever thought about making your own podcast? Anchor makes it really easy for anyone to get started. It's a one-stop shop for recording, hosting, and distributing podcasts. Best of all, it's 100% free. Sign up now at anchor.fm slash new. That's anchor.fm slash new to get started.